Welcome to First Congregational Church in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts for online worship for this second Sunday of Easter, sometimes called Low Sunday because it's the Sunday after a, a big Sunday, Easter Sunday. You're very welcome here with us. Um, my name is Jim Matarazzo. I'm the interim minister. Our senior minister is recovering from what might be COVID-19, and she's doing really well. Um, she will be back with us in several days. Um, so I just wanted to let folks know that Lynn will be back this next Sunday who, when she will preach for us. Um, with me is our music director and organist, Curtis Smith, and his wife, Rachel Smith, who's also going to assist in the service and sing the hymns. So you're very welcome here, and we're glad that you're watching. If you have um, the order of service that's on Facebook and on our website, you can join um, Rachel and I with the um, call to worship. So let us worship God this second Sunday of Easter. Come, let us give thanks to our God. God's steadfast love endures forever. Because of this love, we shall not die. This is God's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our hymn is a well-known hymn, In the Garden. Um, so I'm going to get out of the way and let you watch Curtis play the box organ 
while Rachel and I, not in view, sing. Watch Curtis instead. Thank you very much, Curtis. And Rachel is adjusting the camera. Welcome once again um, on this second Sunday of Easter. Some strange snow on Saturday and then a sunny, I believe, warmer day on Sunday. T t right now is a time for children. So this, of course, our children on the internet. If you are there, you are watching me, and I'm going to try to do this um, without any encouragement, because normally I am talking to you and you're answering back, but this time you're not. So when I preach in a, a few moments, I'm going to be talking about faith in things unseen. And so I wanted to relate this to you. Why do we believe things we haven't seen? Like... Some of you may believe in Santa Claus, or the Easter Bunny, or the Tooth Fairy. Anybody, any others besides those three? Tooth Fairy, Easter Bunny, Chris, uh, Santa Claus, people we don't see but we believe in? Jesus? Okay, that would be good. Jesus, yes, this is the church, Jesus, that's what we do. So we haven't seen Jesus, we haven't seen Santa Claus, we haven't seen the Easter Bunny, we haven't seen the Truth Fairy, but we believe it. But why? So why, why, why do we? And one, one of the reasons we believe in things unseen is because of the testimony of our community, meaning people tell us. Our parents tell us. Our parents say, you know, there's, um, there's a, this guy who gives gifts and secretly comes into houses on Christmas Eve. 
There's this bunny who gives candy and secretly comes on Easter Sunday, um, like magic. And there's this bizarre tooth fairy who secretly comes and sticks money under American children's pillow. I don't know what the tooth fairy does in other countries, but that's what it does here. Depending on which tooth you lose. My niece has been very pleased with the tooth fairy recently because she keeps losing teeth and getting things under her pillow. But why does she believe in that? It's because someone told her. In other words, this idea of believing in things unseen because people we trust tell us that such a thing exists. And so this idea of believing in the unseen. Some people believe in ghosts. Some people don't, right? Um, but why? Um, some people believe because someone told them there was such a thing. Don't go into that house, it's haunted. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't go into that house, it's haunted. Everyone says it's haunted. That may not be true. But the reason you believed it is probably because someone said, don't go into that house, it's haunted. Um, so belief is different than having facts, if you know what a fact is. A fact is something you can actually prove. It's a fact that this is wooden and that it's solid and that I'm leaning on it. That's a fact. Um, but I don't believe in the podium. I just know it's there. But I could believe in Jesus, who I cannot see, but I believe in. I could believe in God. I could believe in Santa Claus, whom I cannot see, but I would like for him to bring me presents. So belief is, is a thing that our community or our parents or our friends might tell us about that we may choose to believe in. And that's really all I have for you this second Sunday of Easter. So I hope you got something from it. We have two readings this morning on this second Sunday of Easter, sometimes called Low Sunday because it was sort of a lesser Sunday. People who don't normally go to church, this would be the Sunday they wouldn't go, like the Sunday after Christmas. Um, and it was often the, the Sunday that seminarians got to preach, probably because ministers figured they couldn't do any damage or what have you. So it was not a popular preaching Sunday. No seminarian for us to have in here today. Um, I could have, could have asked Beth Ann, our seminarian, but I don't believe she's available. So I am your seminarian, which means I don't have to worry about being that good, you know, because it's low Sunday. Low expectation Sunday. So, no, seriously. Okay, the first lesson is from the first epistle to Peter, chapter 1, beginning at the third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his mercy, he has given us new birth and a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through the faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning at the 11th verse. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, 
If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were meeting again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Here ends our readings. There's a lot going on in this morning's readings. Um, the first thing that the thing that stands out is poor Thomas, who has to be the has the other title of doubting Thomas. I'll get to doubting Thomas in a bit, but in the first letter to Peter, he's addressing Christians who have not seen Jesus, but although they have not seen him, they love him, and they trust that they too will share in his resurrection at the last time, the last day. In John's gospel, we have the well-known story of Mary Magdalene in the garden. We just sang the hymn. The hymn we sang is about Mary in the garden with Jesus. Mary is the first witness in the Johannine tradition to the resurrection. And it's important to keep this in mind. The first witnesses in the synoptic gospels and in John are women not men. And that is probably on purpose. Always remember that Jesus turns everything upside down in the world order. In Jewish law, women were not valid witnesses to a crime, only men. But Jesus is appearing to women to witness his resurrection. The male apostles had fled and went into hiding during his crucifixion, except John. So, at the cross were just three women and John. Something to think about. The women remain faithful and do not doubt the resurrection. When Jesus appears to his disciples, displaying his wounds, they believe because they see him. Not necessarily because Mary told them. They believe because they have proof. We want proof. Thomas was not there. And when the disciples tell him he's incredulous, he says, I will not believe unless I see Jesus for myself. In fact, I'm not going to believe unless I can take my hands and put them in the holes in his hands and feet and side. And then 
I will believe that he is risen. He wants concrete, incontrovertible proof. And then Jesus appears to poor Thomas, who finds himself confronted with the risen Christ, who invites him to place his fingers in his wounds so that he might believe. And then Thomas has to bear the rebuke. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So, my message this morning is, let's face it, we're all kind of Thomas, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I would like my own personal epiphany of the risen Lord, and if he invited me to put my hands on him for proof, I'd probably go for it. I mean, I'd be like, well, yeah, there's a hole there, and you're risen, I believe. I, I know. I know. I don't need to believe. I know. And in a way, you could argue that Thomas was given a privilege. He got to see the risen Christ himself. I would like that. Um, I would like to be able to dispel my Easter doubts forever. Right? No, no need for faith when you know. Um, Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, um, was known, unlike his uh, father figure, his mentor, Sigmund Freud, who was an atheist and thought religion was an illusion, Jung was the son of a Swiss reform pastor in Zurich. And he believed in a kind of spirituality and um, all sorts of things that were quite not Freudian. So the Jungian model has room for faith. But Jung was an unusual guy. And when he was on his, one of his last television interviews, um, someone from the BBC said, you know, Dr. Jung, you, you say you have faith um, and that you believe you know, that there is a God or something. And he said, he said, I don't have faith. I know. Wow. I don't have faith. I know. Now, that's interesting because I don't know if I could say that. I could say I have faith. But to say that I know, like, empirically, which is what Jung was saying, because he was basically saying, based on his experience, the experience of his patients, his research, he knows. Pretty good. Almost like Thomas, without having to put your hands into wounds. Um, he knew. But I don't think most of us are like Dr. Jung. I don't think so. I'm not, anyway. So, I would like this. I would like a Thomas experience. I'm willing to be um, named and shamed a little by the Lord for the experience of seeing him in the flesh. Then I would have just touched God the Word incarnate. Right? And that's why, and then Thomas falls to his knees and says, My Lord and my God, a confession of Christ's divinity, which is very outside Thomas's Jewish experience, which would not allow such a thing. So I would like this. I would like this epiphany moment. There are seven prayers attributed to St. Gregory the Great, Bishop of Rome. He is a pope that gave his name to Gregorian chant. If you know Gregorian chant, was named for Pope Gregory, partly because he had reformed the Roman liturgy quite a bit and had set things down into a particular order. He died in 604 AD, and he was deeply admired, not just by Catholic theologians and even Orthodox theologians, but even Protestant theologians. The reformers liked Gregory. Even John Calvin, who didn't like anybody, right? Because, you know, he's always frowning, you know, looking for idolatry. Why are these flowers here? What's that cross? You know, we don't need images. What are these candles? The Holy Spirit does not need landing lights. You don't want to invite John Calvin to a party. You don't. You invite Luther. He's drinking and smoking and belching and dancing and singing, and Calvin is worried that this could be sin. So, you know, Luther, 
I love saying this quote, so I'm going to say it to you again. Luther at a party. The one who drinks beer sleeps long. The one who sleeps long does not sin. Therefore, let us drink beer. Calvin wouldn't say that. However, Calvin liked Gregory, Bishop of Rome. He liked him so much, he said, he was the last good pope. So all the popes after 604 AD, bad popes. But even Calvin liked this pope. So Gregory wrote seven prayers, or is said to have wrote seven prayers, about Christ crucified. And I want to read one of them to you. O Lord Jesus Christ, I adore you hanging on the cross, given vinegar and gall to drink. I beg you, may your wounds be the remedy of my soul. May your wounds be the remedy of my soul. And I wonder, were the wounds of Christ's remedy, the risen wounds remedy to the apostle souls, so crushed at the defeat of the crucifixion to Mary Magdalene in the garden, to Thomas, who was invited to put his hands in the wounds themselves. There's a famous Renaissance altarpiece by Matthias Grunewald called the Isenheim Altarpiece. Rachel and Curtis, have you ever seen this? You must Google it. Google Isenheim altarpiece, I-S-E-N-H-E-I-M, altarpiece. If you Google it, you will find it. It's famous. It was designed for a hospital chapel. And this was right at the beginning of the Renaissance. And hospital chapels were normally run by monks and nuns and religious orders. And medieval and Renaissance hospitals were not places of healing as we know it. Some people recovered with the ministrations of the nuns or the monks or the other helpers if they could get better on their own. But some people did not. There was no medicine as we know it, no procedures. They simply expected, most likely, that they would not make it. And so the role of this hospital was to care for people in their illness and in their dying. So there's a huge triptych which is an altarpiece that has doors that fold open panels. And there's um, several images, but one is a famous crucifix, a crucifixion scene, and the other is a resurrection scene. And in the crucifixion scene, it is truly grotesque. This was a time of Renaissance humanism when instead of painting Jesus in a Stoic or Byzantine way on the cross, they painted an actual tortured human figure. They didn't sugarcoat it. And the one from Grunewald's Isenheim altarpiece is shocking when you first see it. This is a wretched, miserable Christ that is dead and crucified and tortured, and it is awful. But there is also the flip side, the resurrection panel, which is the polar opposite. Christ is glorious, glowing, um, transformed, brilliant light, almost so much light around his head that you can b just see the, barely see the outline of his face and smile. His wounds are still there, but they're glowing. They're transformed. They've gone from misery to glory. So transformation and resurrection is not a change in our circumstance prior, but a glorification of our body and soul. And so the side is glowing, the hands are glowing, the feet are glowing from the wounds made glorious. So if you think about Gregory's prayer, it makes sense. May your glorious transformed wounds be healing to my soul. And what the nuns would do with the people in this hospital is they would show them. They would say, look, you're suffering. Jesus went through this. Look at, look at him. He suffers horribly. So you know that you're not alone. In all your suffering, you suffer with Christ. He suffers with you. This idea that you can unite somehow in the medieval Catholic mindset. You can unite with the sufferings of Christ. Not just medieval Catholic. Um, very strong idea in Lutheran thought, 
in the pietistic thought and in some Protestant thought. This idea of uniting with the crucified somehow, some way through our sufferings here on earth. You are not alone. But then the other piece, this is what you will become. Look at Christ risen. This is your future. Your wounds, your sickness will become glorious and you will conquer. And that's the whole purpose of this artistic display. It's not that the crucifixion is erased in the risen Christ, but that he has overcome it and become victorious, conquering death, sin, and hell. This is Christus Victor, Christ the victorious. This is Easter in its fullness, and there is a reason why it was placed in that chapel and in that hospital, to give people hope against death and the confrontation of death. So this idea that our current reality will be transformed body, soul, and spirit in the life of the world to come. Now, like Thomas, I, as I said before, I'm ready for this encounter. I think, you know, you know in the midst of a pandemic or uncertainty or whatever, I would like Christ to come down this aisle and say, I'm here, touch me. Which is ironic, since we're told to social distance right now, right? You know, but I figure with Jesus, I'm not going to worry about that. The res resurrected Christ is not a source of COVID-19 or other ailments. I want some of that, right? I'm ready to say, my Lord and my God, you're here. That's what I would like. That's what I would like. Uh, Thomas Merton, the Catholic monk who died in the 60s, wrote a lot of different books. And in one, he writes that an encounter with Christ is transformation. We realize possibilities we did not know exist. Hope where there was no hope. Courage where there wasn't courage to face what we must face. So, being like Thomas which is the title of my sermon, may not be a bad thing. It's not that Thomas was wrong to doubt. Doubt and faith go hand in hand. The question was, but why didn't you believe what the women said and what the disciples said? And he's like, well, it wasn't enough, and I understand that. A little bit more about Thomas. Thomas is associated with Syria and India. And some scholars believe that this apostle went to India to spread the gospel in the year 52 AD. And there are indigenous churches in India on the Kerala coast that have been there at least since the third century. It would seem that Doubting Thomas, which is now, by now he's believing Thomas, was the most far-flung missionary of the early church, if he got that far. And I'm going to leave you with a saying of Thomas from something called the Acts of Thomas, a Gnostic text written and what became known the, the Thomas tradition. It didn't make it into the Bible because it comes from a different non-Orthodox source. But these words are beautiful, and I want to leave them to you this second Sunday of Easter. According to this tradition, Thomas said to his followers, I am not Jesus, but I am his servant. I am not Christ, but I am his minister. I am not the Son of God, but I pray to become worthy of God. I say to you, continue in the faith of Christ. Continue in the hope of the Son of God. Have courage in affliction. If you see me mocked, imprisoned, or put to death, do not be confused, because I am doing Christ's will. I may not wish to die, but I know that I can face this through Christ. For death is not real death, but merely being set free from the body. I will be happy to be set free from the body so that I can depart and see Jesus, beautiful and full of mercy, to see him who is to be loved. For I have endured much toil in his service, and I have labored for his grace. 
And this grace is mine, and it shall not be taken away from me. It is not in the New Testament, and we could dismiss this as too Gnostic, too much associated with the wisdom tradition that was let go long ago in the early church, but it does speak of faith in a time of uncertainty, that the promise of Easter is that we too shall see Jesus, the beautiful one, full of mercy, to love him and to be loved by him. Being like Thomas seems to be today the norm. We may drift in and out of resurrection faith, but one thing is certain, and I want you to take this with you. God's grace given to you is yours and cannot be taken away from you. Rest in this grace. Amen. We move into a time of prayer as a community of faith. So my friends, wherever you are, the Lord be with you. And let us pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires are known and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we, through grace, may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. There are many prayers that we have been asked to um, pray for uh, today. We lift up to you, Danny, who's dealing with a new cancer. Pray for Danny. For Sue, Diane, and John, who are recovered or recovering from illness, and for our own minister, Lynn, who is almost fully recovered from illness, we give thanks for their recovery. We pray for Sandy, who has many concerns. We pray for Jamie, um, who's um, a member's son's girlfriend's mother. I'm trying to figure out the constellation. A member's son's girlfriend's mother. She is being treated for COVID-19 in New York City. And we lift up all the people of New York City, which is the epicenter in this country for this illness. Uh, we pray for her daughter, Tiffany, who is not able to be with her mom as she is treated. We pray that Jamie will recover and be able to rejoin her family as soon as possible. We pray for John K., who had a heart attack. And we pray for Jack C., who has cancer. We pray for all the things that we are not praying for right now because we are consumed by this pandemic. It's so easy to forget that all the troubles of the world are still there, still going on. And yet we are in an emergency both nationally and globally. And it's hard to even have time to think about all the other things that we normally keep in mind. 
We pray for hot spots in this country and worldwide, and the fearful, people who are afraid of getting sick, people who are sick. We pray for those who are living with COVID-19. Um, we pray that they recover, but we also pray for those who are at this moment dying of COVID-19. We pray for the protesters who want an end to the national lockdown, but we also pray for their neighbors who fear what that could mean. We pray for the jobless and the destitute, remembering that in the shutdown of the economy, many people are struggling to pay bills, to put food on the table, and to live lives because they cannot work. We pray for seniors who are unable to graduate with their high school or college class this year. We pray for crushed uh, the crushing of um, dreams of athletes and all those people whose plans were crushed by this crisis, the disappointments that are worldwide. We pray for all those who are in nursing care or elder care facilities who cannot be visited at this time, um, including my mother, whom I can only call but not visit. And we pray for those and their families who want to be with them but cannot. We, we pray that this pandemic will come to a conclusion so we may rejoin our common life together. We also pray for those who have died. For John's sister, Helen, who died in Florida after a long illness. Please pray for those who could not be with her um, due to the pandemic. Um, we lift up Helen to God's safekeeping. We pray for Nidra Beloris, who died recently. We pray for her two sons who could not be with her because of restrictions. We pray for their families and all who grieve her loss, including Sue and Dave, her friends, who are mourning her passing. We pray for all those who could not be at the bedside of loved ones who are dying of this dread illness. We lift up all health care workers, medical researchers, first responders, grocery clerks, electricians, plumbers, and gas fitters, all the people that are keeping the lights on, the water running, the heat on, the cooling on, that keep our common life together, who are putting themselves at risk for the sake of the wider community. We lift up all those prayers spoken now or in the silence of our hearts or to yourself, wherever you are watching this, praying for answers, praying for grace, and praying for courage. And we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All of you um, in this congregation over the several weeks have been very generous in your posting offerings for the ministry of this church for, with online donations on our website. We are delighted that you have kept us in mind and felt that you could spare your treasures um, for the life and work of this church both now and when we reopen. Easter has 50 days, hence Pentecost, the 50th day. Um, Pentecost Sunday is, I believe, May 31st this year. And if we are very lucky, we may even be able to have people beyond staff in our church. Maybe not, but we can hope. So we hope for the opening of this church in the Pentecostal season. So please continue to support us 
in our ministry, um, in this town and community. We sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Christ the Word made flesh born low. Praise Holy Spirit evermore. One God triune whom we adore. Amen. Holy God. All things come from you, and of your own we have given you. We offer all our treasures, the gifts of work and labor, the gifts of ourselves, to you and to our neighbors. Bless what we can offer, and may it prosper in some way the coming of your holy kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. To close our online worship, we sing together... Come ye faithful, raise the strain. forth into the world and wherever you are and whatever you do in peace. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and all those whom you love this day 
and forever. Amen. Curtis is... Oh. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Curtis, for playing that piece, which is by Charles Gounod, the o Divine Redeemer. Um, we will be with you next Sunday at the usual time over the airways. Um, God bless, and see you next week. Thanks. Thanks, Rich.